text for this morning's sermon. While you're getting there, let me ask you a question. When there are problems in a local congregation, why do these problems often occur? Well, in some cases, the answer is because brethren aren't teaching, or they are teaching, things that are not found in the scriptures. Oftentimes, it might be because there has been a misunderstanding among two or more brethren, and this misunderstanding was not dealt with in the proper way, and problems developed after that. And still other times it might be that there was an unloving attitude among brethren, which of course is a breeding ground for problems. All of these are good answers, and all of them are right answers. But I might I suggest that there is a fourth reason that there might be a problem among the congregation, and that's the church has a diatrophies among them. A diatrophies is a name, not, a, not an it. It is a person in the Bible. And you might ask, well, what is a diatrophies? Well, it is the type of spirit that the apostle John dealt with in the book of 3 John. Let's now read 3 John, the first eight verses. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers with the truth. The book of 3 John was written by the Apostle John, probably around 90 AD. And by word count, the book of 3 John is the shortest book in the Bible. Because of its size, it can sometimes be overlooked uh, on the way to the book of Revelation, or if you're going just past a couple of the books, you can easily pass 2 and 3 John, even Jude, uh, on the way to Revelation. And so it can sometimes be overlooked, even though it contains very valuable lessons. The book was not written to a church, though when we read verse 9 a little later, it will become apparent as to why that is. Instead, the book was written to a man named Gaius. The name Gaius is mentioned four other times in scriptures. In Acts 19, 29, we find a man named Gaius who was a Macedonian. In Acts 20, verse 4, we find a Gaius of Derby, Derby being a city in Asia Minor. In Romans 16, 23, and 1 Corinthians 1, 14, we find a man named Gaius who lived in Corinth. It could be that one of these three men of the Gaius that the book of 3 John was written to, or it could be that this is another Gaius, because Gaius is a pretty popular name. It's sort of like Jack for James, uh, a pretty popular name. Now, it's sort of like me writing. To James. Unless you know a little bit more about the person, you have no idea if I'm writing to James Brown or James Lacey, seeing as how they're both members here, or if I'm writing to probably the other James, like James Sullivan, who's my cousin. It's not important that we know exactly who this Gaius is. What is important, though, is that we realize what type of man this Gaius was. Gaius was a Christian who had the truth in him. In our study of 2 John, a few, uh, I think it was last month, we noted how important it was for Christians to walk in truth. So here we have this Gaius, a man who walked in truth, and how did he exhibit that he walked in truth? What was the indicators that John said was that he walked in truth? By being hospitable towards the brethren among him, and by being hospitable to strangers, brethren who came to him that he did not know. A lot of time people think that in order to be walking in the truth, all you have to have is the right doctrine. You believe in baptism for the remission of sins. You reject 
the denominational structure of the church. You worship God in the proper way. All of these things are important, but there is much more to walking in truth than simply appearing to be religious. God not only wants us to be doctrinally correct, he wants us to live our lives with our eyes on the welfare of others above ourselves. In 1 John 4, verses 20 and 21, we read, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God in whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Gaius was not simply a Sunday morning Christian. He was a man who worshipped God the right way, but he was also a man who helped out in any way that was possible. Someone came visiting and needed a place to stay, he would offer his house. Someone needed some food, he would offer them a meal. They needed provisions to be sent on their way, he would provide them. He was loving of his brethren in any way that was needed. That is what Christ wants us to do. And that's the principle that Christ was teaching the disciples on the night before his crucifixion. If you would turn to John 13, we're going to read this example that Christ left for us to follow. In John 13, let's read verses 3 to 17. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are, all not, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now I know that many people under, misunderstand what Jesus is teaching here. He is not teaching that Christians are to practice ritualistic foot washing. He is teaching that Christians are to serve one another. If someone needs their feet washed, then I'm to wash their feet. But Jesus but Peter wanted Jesus to wash his entire body. He said, you don't need your entire body clean. You need your feet clean. Why did Peter need his feet clean? Because they wore sandals and they were out in the uh, dirt all day. Feet were black and filthy. Peter needed his feet washed. That's why Jesus washed his feet. His lesson was service, which is exactly what Jeff was teaching us last week, about being servants of others. So today, if someone needs their feet washed, I can wash their feet, and I should wash their feet. We wear socks and shoes, though, so it's not likely that I might need my feet washed. However, there are other things that I can do to show my service to other brethren. If someone needs a place to stay, I'm to do that. A ride to work, I'm to do that. Anything my brethren needs, I'm able to do that, I'm to do that. Gaius followed after Christ's example, and we're to follow after Christ's example. Contrast that attitude to the attitude of another man in 3 John, the man named Diotrephes. Let's go back to 3 John and read verses 9 to 11. I wrote to the church, but to Di but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, 
he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. By reading through John, it appears that Gaius and Diotrephes worshipped at the same congregation. But even though they worshipped together, their attitudes couldn't be farther apart. Having spent some time already discussing what was right with Gaius, let's now spend the rest of our remaining time discussing what was wrong with the attitude of Diotrephes and how can we avoid behaving like him. The first thing that was wrong with the attitude of Diotrephes was that he loved to be preeminent. What does that mean? He wanted to be first among the brethren in a position of power. That sounds familiar, it should, for that was often an issue that the disciples dealt with during Jesus' ministry. In Matthew 18, 1 we read, at, the time, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Whenever you have a group of people who are around one another long enough, it seems only natural that a pecking order emerges. You'll have the leader of the group, then you'll have the spokesman of the group, the people who are close to the leaders in positions of influence, and then you'll have the rest of the group. When Jesus was on earth with the disciples, he was the leader of the group. Jesus had told the disciples, though, that he would die one day, and after that, they would be given the task to go out and preach his message, the gospel of salvation, to the whole world. Now, there were 12 of them. Certainly one of them would be the greatest, and the others would follow on behind, right? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 2 to 4. And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus gave the disciples quite the rebuke here. At that point in time, the disciples thought, simply because they were following Jesus around, that they were already in the kingdom. And then therefore, they were concerned about their rank in the kingdom. Jesus, in actuality, told them here that unless their attitude changed, they would not even enter the kingdom. Why? Because God will not accept us in arrogance. He requires us to be humble and accept him as preeminent, and everybody else, including ourselves, as inferior. He requires us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus and Jesus alone. And he requires us to put others above ourselves. Paul said the same thing in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4, which reads, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Knowing that this is what the Lord desires of us, let us not think of being a Christian as being in competition with one another. It is not my job to see how much better of a Christian that I can be than you, or that you can be than me. We all have our strengths that we can use for the cause of Christ, and we all have our weaknesses that we need help through faith in Christ and assistance from our brethren to overcome. By working together, we can lift each other up and grow closer to Christ. Such was not Diotrephes' attitude. He did not want to humble himself and serve others. He wanted to be seen as preeminent and be ruler over the congregation. So that was one problem with Diotrephes. Second problem was that Diotrephes didn't accept the words of the apostles. The end of verse 9 says that Diotrephes does not <coughs> receive us, meaning that he did not accept the words of John. From reading the book as a whole and comparing what Gaius did with what Diotrephes did, it appears that John had written a letter to this congregation that has since been lost to history, commending certain preachers to come and teach among them. Gaius received these men and was hospitable towards them, while Diotrephes rejected John's letter and rejected those teachers sent by John. The apostles were the ones sent out by Jesus Christ to teach the gospel to the whole world. 
And it was the words of the apostles that people were to follow. In John 4, verse 6, John writes, We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The us in that verse that I just read is not me. It is not the church as some institution. The us in that passage is the apostles, John being one of them. We can know whether or not someone is teaching the truth as to whether or not they are following the words of the apostles. If they are, then they are of God and are following the truth. If they are not, they are not of God. They are in error and are in need of repentance, or they will be judged as unrighteous by God in the last day and be cast into hell. By rejecting the words of John, Diotrephes had chosen to reject Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Why Diotrephes chose to reject the words of John, we, do, we don't know. Perhaps he viewed John as too old, a relic of the past. Perhaps that he and John had previously had a dispute over Diotrephes' arrogance. Or perhaps Diotrephes felt that his power was being threatened by John's letters and the preachers that were being sent. Or perhaps it was something else. But regardless, Diotrephes had no right to reject the words of the apostle. John was not asking Diotrephes to sin. He was not teaching Diotrephes to follow after some false doctrine. So Diotrephes should have heeded the words of John and followed after Christ. Today we must be careful that we don't follow along the same path. We have the words written by the apostles down for us in the Bible. They are the words we're to follow. We're not to follow after men or the doctrines of men, for only God can save us from sin. So Diotrephes was wrong because he sought to be preeminent, and because he rejected the words of the apostles. What else? Diotrephes was wrong because he prated against the apostles and against other Christians. Prating is a word that we don't use very often. How many used it last week? I don't see, I don't see any hands. Uh, in fact, I would have been shocked had I seen a hand go up. If you use prated in your, in your vocabulary this week, we don't use it that often. So what does it mean? means to babble on against someone or to talk idly against someone. This may occur in different forms like gossip or slander or simply using evil words against someone in order to hurt their reputation. Whatever Diotrephes was saying about John and other Christians was sinful, for that's not how we're to speak. Jesus warned in Matthew 12, 37 that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. In that context, Jesus is warning people about the condition of a person's heart and how it will be determined by their fruit. If your heart is righteous, then you will speak righteously, and in that context, accept Jesus. But if your heart is wicked, you will speak evil things. When it comes to our words, we will only speak what is truly in our heart. My dad always used to say that you will know what a person is really like. If you want to know that, observe what happens to them when they hit their thumb with a hammer or stub their toe against the door. Will they curse and swear or simply yell out in pain? That will tell you. People can hide it all the time. They can be very careful with their words when they're around people who knows that they won't accept that type of language. But then in private, they'll use it. But if you hit your thumb with a hammer, you don't have time to think. Whatever's in your heart will come out. And you'll really know the condition that that person's living in. When it comes, how we are to, when it comes to how we are to speak to others, what does the Bible tell us? James 4.11 says that we're not to speak evil of one another. Speaking evil of someone doesn't mean that we don't point out when someone is in sin. It means we don't gossip or spread rumors about them. We don't speak about them behind their back or slander their reputation. If we have something to say about someone, we tell it to them. And we resolve our differences in that manner. Allowing gossip and slander to persist is a surefire way of allowing divisiveness to enter the congregation. Something that Diotrephes was doing, 
by what he was saying about John and the other Christians. Paul said in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That is how a Christian is to behave. We're to treat our brethren the way we would want to be treated. Sometimes that does require us to point out some hard truths, but it never involves gossip, backbiting, or slander. That type of speech is always wrong and needs to be avoided by Christians. When we speak, we must, all ha we must have all of the facts. We must speak the truth with the goal of honoring Christ with our mouth. We cannot do that. We should not speak. Vice diatrophy should have healed. And finally, Diotrephes was wrong because he was dividing the church over his opinions. By seeking to be preeminent, Diotrephes was placing him in, as, in placing himself as the sole arbiter of truth. He rejected the jump letter of John and for whatever reason seemingly rejected the preacher sent by John. He spoke evil of John and other Christians behind their backs, refused to have fellowship with them with the goal of having the congregation conform to his opinion. And what of those who did not agree? He sought to have them put out of the church. Church discipline is commanded in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 1, we read, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump since you were truly unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. When someone is living in sin and refuses to repent and come out of it, it, the con it is the congregation's responsibility to withdraw fellowship from that brother or sister until they repent. That would mean that we wouldn't eat and drink with them or have common fellowship with them while they are living in sin. It does not mean that we can never talk with them or we cannot be seen in public with them. It means our relationship with them changes in the hopes that they will repent and return to Christ. But notice here, withdrawal of fellowship was done over sin, not someone's opinion. It was a collective action done by the church as a means of last resort. It was not an individual action that was bound on the congregation after that. And the purpose was to cause someone to repent. It was not a punitive action to punish someone for not following after someone's opinion. Diotrephes was abusing the scriptural use of discipline for his own purposes and did so in order to control others. In doing so, he was dividing the congregation and those who would follow him and his opinions and those who would not. That is not how a congregation is to function. The head of every congregation is Christ and we're to follow him and him alone. We're to be united in that truth. And only when someone strays from the truth found in the Bible and refuses to repent of it is a brother to be disciplined. If we fail in this regard, we have allowed the wisdom of men to replace the wisdom of God We've sinned against our brother, a sin that we will answer for on the judgment day. So that is what is wrong with diatrophies. Quickly now, how can we avoid the diatrophy syndrome, which was the title of this morning's lesson, and be the Christians that God wants us to be? First of all, we need to learn to be humble. In 1 Peter 5, verse 5, Peter writes, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It is very easy to become filled with pride and be arrogant. Whether it's the fact that we've had our sins forgiven in Christ, 
whether we're the preacher or the elders or the deacons or part of some work in the church, the devil will always tempt us to become proud of who we are or what we have become. But having such thoughts is sinful. I am the pre I am a preacher, not the preacher. I am a preacher of the gospel, just like Peter was. But what did Peter say in Acts 10:26? Stand up. I myself also am a man. We do not have elders and deacons in this congregation, but if we did, do they have the right to be proud? No. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3 says of elders, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, seeing, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Despite what our society tells us, there is nothing special about us that gives us the right to put ourselves above others when it comes to attitude. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need the same Savior, Jesus Christ, and the same grace in order for our sins to be forgiven. We are all unprofitable servants. When we realize this, we will learn humility before God and our brethren and put off arrogance. And if we put off arrogance, it will go a long way towards avoiding this diatribe syndrome. Another thing we can do is become involved in the congregation. We did not know if Diotrephes was a preacher or if he was an elder, but he may have been. In a congregation without elders, it is very easy to fall into the trap of allowing one man, usually the preacher, to lead the congregation while the others follow along behind. This is never what the scriptures had in mind. Scriptures want the entire church to work together and to grow together. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start reading at verse 12. Listen to how the body is to fit together. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink in one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased and if they were all one member where would the body be but now indeed there are many members yet one body and the eye cannot say to the hand i have no need of you nor again the head the head to the feet i have no need of you no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on these we bestow greater honor and on our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. <coughs> now you are all the body of Christ, and members individually. This passage is speaking of spiritual gifts. But the principle applies that every member of the congregation is important and should be used. Now, yes, God has given certain roles to men and others to women. But all that means is that we should try to glorify God in the role that he has given us. Women can teach children. They can teach other women. They can assist in teaching the lost in a private setting. They can edify and build up other Christians through their example. They can be hospitable. They can comfort the sick. They can be of service to those who have need. They can do all good works that God has designed for them to do. Where did I get that from? I got that from 1 Timothy chapter 5 when it talks about the qualifications of a widow who is a widow indeed that the church might support that widow if they have no other family. There are certain qualifications. Look at that list, and you will know what the role of a woman is in the church. 
And what a woman can do, she can do all things that God has designed for her to do. Men can be public teachers. They can lead in the public worship. They can teach the lost. They can desire to be qualified to become elders and deacons. They can be hospitable themselves and be of service to other Christians. All of those roles are to be desired, and none of them is more important than others. The congregation needs Christians who serve just as much as they need a preacher. We need encouragers just as much as we need song leaders. Instead of being envious of what someone else can do or be discouraged by what I can't do, be involved in what you can and grow in the gospel. We are very fortunate here that we have so many people who are willing to become involved even if they are doing things that are not visible to everyone else. There's so much that's going on that you don't see. But there are people involved in this congregation in some way, shape, or form. When we all pull together and not simply have one man leading the show, it results in a more unified congregation, thus making it a lot harder for the diatrophy syndrome to develop. The third thing we can do is desire to appoint scripturally qualified elders and deacons. When a congregation does not have elders and deacons, as I alluded to earlier, the danger is that the preacher leads the congregation and basically becomes the de facto elder. This is dangerous, not because the preacher would necessarily become the ruler of the congregation, though that is possible, but because the temptation is there for him to become such. As we just said, becoming involved in the congregation goes a long way to prevent this, but appointing scripturally qualified elders and deacons goes even further. Notice that I said the phrase scripturally qualified. We should not desire just to appoint anyone to be an elder. So that makes it much more likely that we will appoint a diatrophies type person. We should desire to appoint men that meet the qualifications found in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. We should also not seek to appoint one person as an elder. <coughs> For the scriptural pattern, is that two or more people serve as elders, quite possibly, so that you don't have one person ruling the congregation. In our study on Wednesday night, we saw how the Catholic Church has developed, and the first way that the Church of the New Testament strayed away from the pattern is by leaving the pattern of multiple elders and going to one elder rule. The duty of elders is to look out for the spiritual well-being of the congregation. In Acts 20, verse 28, we read, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In congregations without elders, there is nobody who has oversight of the congregation. Due to that, problems with the congregation within the congregation can be missed or not properly dealt with. But it also gives rise to one person deciding that they will provide that oversight when the scriptures does not give them that right. What we as a congregation should be doing right now is trying our best with the situation that we're in and work together to further our collective growth. But we should be seeking to develop men to be elders so that in the future we can appoint them. Having elders doesn't mean that we will never have a diatrophies, but it will mean that we have scripturally qualified men to be able to deal with the situation should it occur, meaning that the congregation has a stronger chance of coming through such an issue without division. And finally, we can avoid, we can avoid the diatrophies syndrome by scripturally disciplining those who display this type of attitude. Sowing division and desiring to be preeminent in the church is something that the scriptures condemn. And they also say that people who practice this should be withdrawn from. In Titus chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, Paul writes, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. 
The church should not and cannot tolerate someone pressing their own opinion as gospel truth or seeking to run the church when they are not authorized to do so. Allowing this will lead others to become discouraged and quite possibly leave, and it will lead to division among those who remain. It may not be easy to deal with a person who is behaving improperly, but we must, out of concern for their soul and out of concern for the souls of others. Again, our actions should not be taken out of hatred, but out of love, seeking that the person repent and return to Christ. A church that properly disciplines its members when required and does so fairly and in love is the one that will remain pure and united as Christ desires. And so in conclusion, the diatrophy syndrome is very real and it is very dangerous. If allowed to exist among a congregation, churches will not grow as they should, they will not evangelize as they should, and they will not be united as they should. Let each and every one of us examine ourselves and become the type of person Christ desires of us. One who is humble before God and is loving towards our brethren, putting others before ourselves. Let's become active in the congregation, not to seek the glory and the accolades of others, but to spread the gospel of the kingdom and to glorify God. Because in the end, God is the one who is important, not us. He created us in his image. He sent Jesus to die <coughs> on the cross for our sins, and he saved us through faith and obedience to his son. If we keep that in mind and follow Christ, we will avoid the diatrophy syndrome and be saved when this life is over. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to